Hey everybody, welcome to the Manalik. I'm John as always, and it's time for the second last set review video. Today we're going to be looking at all of the colorless Eldrazi cards, and we're also going to be looking at all the multicolored cards. Tomorrow we'll take a look at the artifacts, the lands, and some set review wrap-up kind of stuff. Now, as you hopefully all know, there are three big disclaimers with the set reviews. They are often the white and the blue set reviews. You should watch those anyways. You want to know the whole set. You don't just want to know a tiny subset of the set. So go check those out. The most important one, of course, is this is a limited set review. This is for draft, for sealed, not for constructed. But we're going to jump into the first colorless card right away. Up first, we have Deceiver of Form. Deceiver of Form is a six and a colorless. So that means that you can pay six anything, whether it's colored or colorless mana, but one extra mana must be colorless. It cannot be any other color. Uh, it is a creature Eldrazi at rare. It's an 8-8, eight, eight, and it says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, reveal the top card of your library. If a creature card is revealed this way, you may have creatures you control other than Deceiver of Form become copies of that card until end of turn. You may put that card on the bottom of your library. So this is uh, uh, interesting. I, I like it because it's what an Eldrazi should do. It should do something really strange, like randomly flipping a card off the top and saying, hey, do you want everything to be that card this turn? Ah, go right ahead. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I'm just not a big fan of that kind of randomness, uh, you know, when you're actually playing to win and trying to play competitively. So, so kind of my big question is, how many amazing creatures does the average deck have? Not many. You know, this is probably going to be one of the best creatures in your deck. You know, an 8-8 an eight eight is huge. If you flip a 2-2 two two that, I don't know, has Vigilance on it, you're probably not going to want to turn your entire team into that. You're probably going to have uh, some creatures that are better than that. You know, you're not going to get any enter the battlefield effects off of creatures. So any creatures that are awesome because of their enter the battlefield effects, you're not going to get that because they don't enter the battlefield. They just turn into it. And so I, I really don't know if this is going to go off all that often. The one place I could see it being decent would be with a bunch of flyers in your deck. But then, of course, if you have a bunch of flyers, maybe this would just be better as a 3-3 three, three flyer or a 4-4 four, four flyer or something. Um, so I don't know about Deceiver Reform. It's really fun. I, I, I'd i love to play with it. I, I'll totally, pl hopefully play with it on a Wacky Wednesday in a Rare Draft or something. But I think ultimately it's just way too janky for serious limited play. Um, I'll give it a C because it is an 8-8 for 7, so it is slightly under-costed. And uh, you get to see what your top card is, I guess. And it, So it's kind of got a scry built into it, although that scry is revealed to your opponent as well. But... I don't know, too janky, I think, for serious play, but I'm excited to see what it does for fun's sake anyways. So, middle of the road to see. Next up, we have Eldrazi Mimic. Eldrazi Mimic is a two generic, not colorless, creature Eldrazi at rare. It's a 2-1, and whenever another colorless creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may change Eldrazi Mimic's base power and toughness to that creature's power and toughness until end of turn. This is kind of cute, but it's also kind of also like Deceiver of Forms in that how many times in a game are you going to cast something whose power and toughness makes you go, yeah, I want another one of those for the turn? Maybe two or three times at best. Now, the fact that this is a 2-1 two, for 2 makes it fine. I'll take it. Of course, I'd much more prefer a 2-2 two, two for 2, and there are a number of 2-2s two, for 2 in the set. Um, so I'm not stoked on its stats, but its stats are fine. And the fact that it can become bigger, you know, probably three or four times on average, I would say, uh, in the course of a game it is fine enough. Um, again, it's one of these rares that I do not want to first pick. I do not want to first pick this card in any way, shape, or form. But I'll take it and I'll play it probably every time I have it. Um, I just won't be massively excited about it. So I'm going to go with a C plus on it. Um, yeah, I, I wish there were more rares in this set that's that were you know, first pickable. There's an awful lot that are, uh, unfortunately, you know, late picks like the Oaths and things like that. And a number that are good, but really just feel more like the uncommon kind of level. So Eldrazi Mimic, C+. Uh, I'll play it. I'm just not excited about it. Next up, we have something that is decidedly not janky, Endbringer. Endbringer is five generic and one colorless. Creature Eldrazi rare. It's a 5-5. Five, five. Untap Endbringer during each other player's untap step. Tap 
Endbringer deals one damage to target creature or player. Pay a colorless and tap. Target creature can't attack or block this turn. Pay two colorless, tap, draw a card. I like this card a lot. It seems insanely good. 5-5 five, five for 6 is already passable. It's not the best, but it's okay. If it was just a vanilla dumb creature, it would be kind of, you know, pure filler. But this is anything but a big dumb vanilla creature. The abilities make this thing amazing. Uh, at a minimum, it's 2 damage. Uh, one damage on your end step and one on theirs to their face. Uh, you could, uh, you know, ping off any X ones that are there. Um, be aware, this will be a rules note. I'm sure it'll come up at some point. You can't respond to this on tapping during uh, your opponent's on tap step. Uh, or as people have been yelling at me, untap. I apparently say untap a little bit weird. Um, nobody has priority during the on tap step. This just on taps. So don't wait until your opponent's turn to try to get in that extra damage before this untaps. You don't have a chance to do that. You need to do this at the end of your turn before their untap step at the start of their turn. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, this can deal two damage to their face over the you know a quick couple of phases. You can ping off X ones. Uh, you could even do six damage if you could attack with it and then, uh, you know, on tap it on their turn and then tap it at the end of their turn again to do another uh, point of damage. Um, it can lock creatures down. It can let creatures through. You can draw cards off of it. It's just insane. And this seems like an instant first pick to me. Uh, I don't think you should ever pass this. I'm super excited to play with Endbringer. Uh, it's like Nettle Drone's great big giant brother. Uh, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, I've got to go with a solid, solid, solid A. Next up, we have uh, the first card of the set that was spoiled or slash leaked. Um, Kozilek, the Great Distortion. Kozilek, the Great Distortion is eight. Colorless, colorless. So you must have two sources that are colorless and then eight anything colorless or colored. This is a legendary creature, Eldrazi at Mythic. It is a 12-12. And when you cast Kozilek, the Great Distortion, if you have fewer than seven cards in hand, draw cards equal to the difference. It has menace, because why not? And you can discard a card with converted mana cost X to counter target spell with converted mana cost X. Uh, yeah. Kozilek is pretty darn big. Like Ulamog, it's not going to be right to play him a lot of the time. 10 mana is hard. 8 CC is harder than 10 generic. Make sure that you have Scions, Kozilek Channelers, something to fuel this, as it would be the worst feeling ever to be at 10 mana but not have two colorless producers. Uh, Abilities-wise, this thing's insane. It's a 12-12 that has to be double chump blocked. So even if your opponent has chump blockers, it's going to take half the time to get through their team as it would if this didn't have, have menace. Um, the fact that it refills your hand is awesome, which ideally provides you with a billion counter spells on demand to counter any removal or anything like that. Um, I think Kozilek is just fantastic. I I'm pretty happy to play him if I first pick him. If I pack two, pick him. Well, I hope I was in the right stuff in pack one, but I've got to go with a solid A. He's just great. Just make sure that you do play him when it's appropriate, and you do not when it is not appropriate. Next up, we have Kozilek's Pathfinder. Kozilek's Pathfinder is a six generic creature Eldrazi at common. It's a five five, and you can pay a single colorless to have target creature can't block Kozilek's Pathfinder this turn. Uh, five five for six. I said with um, Endbringer that that's fine, and five five for six is fine, but it is starting to get into the. Uh, uh, the big, dumb, and useless area of creatures, unless it has a fantastic ability or evasion or something else on it. This has pseudo-evasion. If you have a colorless source or, or mul multiple colorless sources and your opponent has a fairly weak board state, you know, if they have five creatures on the other side of the board, you know, you're not going to get through all that easily, but you can make anything that would trade with this unable to block. Um, so, you know, if you do have the colorless sources, I think this is fine, and I think this is... Uh, Probably a decent enough include, but I think it is a fairly low pick. I'm going to go with a C on it. Um, I, I think you can take it if you want it, leave it if you don't. And uh, yeah, not much else to say about it, really. Just middle of the road C. Next up, we have Matter Reshaper. Matter Reshaper is two generic and one colorless creature Eldrazi rare for a 3-2. And it says when Matter Reshaper dies, reveal the top card of your library. You may put that card onto the battlefield if it's a permanent card with converted mana cost three or less. Otherwise, put that card into your hand. 
So it's a 3-2 for 3, which is fine. That That's a fairly normal cost. It's not the ultimate vanilla test pass, but it is a totally passable card. It's a, a, a stats-to-cost ratio that we're pretty... Uh, used to and it does draw you a card at absolute worst if the uh if the top card is not a permanent if it's an instant or sorcery or enchant well even enchantments is a, a permanent uh, or it is bigger than three cmc but if what you uh reveal off the top is less than that then you get to put down a creature that replaces itself maybe it even gets another three two for three uh or you know a land so it ramps you up uh, and the land does not enter tapped which is nice um yeah, I think this is just a totally fine card. Um, I think it's just shy of being first pickable because it is just a 3-2 that draws you a card or gets you something small or some, somewhat useful onto the battlefield. Um, so I think it's kind of like solid B territory, but I, I think it is just really good. I think in a weak pack, this might actually be the first pick. Uh, I'm pretty happy to take this card. I'm pretty happy to play this card. Matter, Reshaper, solid B. Next up, we have Reality Smasher. Reality Smasher is four generic, one colorless creature Eldrazi at rare for a 5-5. It has Trample, it has Haste, and whenever Reality Smasher becomes the target of a spell and an ability an opponent controls, counter that spell, unless its controller discards a card. So, uh, yeah, I was, I was waiting for the downside to show up on this card. It's a 5-5 five, five for 5. It has Trample. It has Haste. I, I was so ready for this whole uh, whenever it becomes the ability or target of a spell or ability, you exile it, kill it, destroy it, something like that happens. But no, you counter the spell uh, unless their opponent throws away an extra card as well. Um, I, I really like this. Uh, I really, really like it. It totally passes and demolishes the vanilla test because it is a 5-5 five, five for 5 with two really nice keywords on it. And uh, yeah, if your opponent wants to kill it, they're going to have to spend two cards on it. Now, maybe they spend just a useless land they don't want, but maybe they spend something else. And it means that they're not going to, you know, burn this thing. They're not going to tap this thing down. They're not going to spend anything, any ability or any spell that doesn't kill this thing uh, without spending a whole lot of extra cards on it. Um, I think this thing just seems super, super, super solid and, and seems like a solid first pick to me. Uh, it, I, 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 I ever slightly don't like it because it doesn't have uh, evasion and it doesn't, do anything to the board but a 5-5 trample haste that uh has you know pseudo protection on it just seems really solid so i'm gonna go with an a minus on it um still totally and utterly first pickable though i think next up we have spatial contortion spatial contortion is one and a colorless instant at uncommon target creature gets plus three minus three until end of turn hey look at that it's cheaper great removal um somewhat on the power of complete disregard because it's going to kill uh something with three toughness which generally has three power it won't be killing big things but uh you know it can also be negated in a few ways by a negate or, or by uh making the opponent or making the creature uh, a little bit bigger in toughness but on the early turns of the game this can get a key attack or blocker out of the way um it can be a huge hit to an opponent's early game plan in a pinch you could even use this as a pump spell you know if you had a 4-4 you could make it into a 7-1 um seems like a pretty high pick to me I i'm pretty happy with spatial contortion um i, I give it a b minus i think it's great um it it's not quite the most premium of removal because it is slightly focused towards the early game you do have to have a colorless source but i think it is still totally solid at b minus next up we have thought not seer three and a colorless for a creature eldrazi at rare it's a four four when thought not seer enters the battlefield target opponent reveals his or her hand you choose a non-land card from it and exile that card when thought not seer and leaves the battlefield target opponent draws a card so you get a 4-4 four, for four, 4, which is totally fine, totally passes the vanilla test, and you get to Thought Seize away a card without paying two life. That, that's a solid upside, plus that card goes into exile, which fuels processors and etc. Um, giving your opponent a card draw on its death is a downside for sure, but a random card is worse than their best card in hand, assuming that you didn't, you know, just completely whiff on a hand of, you know, lands or, or otherwise garbage um but i don't think this is a first pick card you know just like thought seize wasn't a first pick card i don't think this is quite a first pick card i think it's fantastic still i'm really happy with it but i think 
you will take just premium removal and some other premium creatures over this. I do really like it, but I don't think it's first pick. I, I've got to go with a solid B on it. Uh, I'll, I'll always be happy to play it, and I'll always be happy to take it second pick, third pick, fourth pick. Uh, if I see it later than that, I'll be pretty happy to pick it up. Um, but yeah, I, I'm pretty happy with it, just not quite first pick to me. Solid B. Next up, we have Walker of the Wastes. Walker of the Wastes is four and a colorless for a creature Eldrazi at Uncommon. It's a 4-4, it has Trample, and it says Walker of the Wastes gets plus one, plus one for each land you control named Wastes. This is bad. <laughs> uh, this is bad. It's a 4-4 Trample for five, which actually is, you know, it, it's not the worst. It, it's probably properly cost. The 4-4 Trample for 4 would be probably just a little bit too good. It's fine. It's just nothing to write home about. The big question here, of course, is how many wastes will the average colorless deck have? And I'm not entirely sure. I think it really depends on if people start taking wastes over trash in the end of the pack. Um, I arguably don't think you want to play wastes all that much, even if you're a quote-unquote colorless deck. I think you really want creatures that produce colorless mana, scions, good colorless lands. I think wastes are a really low pick and probably not what you want in your deck unless you really whiffed on getting those any of those other colorless sources. So ultimately, I think this is going to be a 4-4 four, for four, 5 almost all of the time. Maybe it'll become a 5-5. Five, five trample for five in which case it's just kind of okay but i don't want to go all in on this i don't want to go all in on wastes i want the multitude of other colorless sources that are out there um so i'm going to go with a c minus on walker of the waste i'm going to pass it and not really play it most of the time i think Next up, we have Warden of Geometries. Warden of Geometries is a four generic creature Eldrazi drone at common. It's a 2-3. It has Vigilance. Tap. Add a colorless tier mana pool. Here is a colorless mana producer that I was talking about. It's ever so slightly expensive as a 2-3 for four. It does have Vigilance, but I don't think that justifies it being four. But it's a fantastic colorless generator. If it can attack in, it can do so with Vigilance and not have to tap down, so you still have your colorless source there. Um, I think it'll also be nice because I think many people won't want it late into pack one or pack two. They will not have uh, picked up any colorless uh, casting costs or colorless activated abilities, and so you should be able to get these a little bit later in pack one and pack two, so you shouldn't have to uh, waste a high, high pick on these. But if you've picked up some colorless abilities, you'll be very happy to see one of these go around. Uh, I would so much prefer one of these in my deck over a wastes. Um, solid C plus to me. Uh, yeah, grab these and be fairly happy with them uh, when you have a colorless uh, uh, reason to have it. I wouldn't, however, spend a pick on this if I didn't already have a reason to pick one. So keep that in mind. That, that's the way that I'm going to kind of approach them, but we'll see how it goes. But I'm going to go with a C plus on Warden of Geometries. Next up, we have Warping Whale, W-A-I-L. Like a cry, not a giant marine mammal. Uh, one generic and one colorless for an instant at uncommon. Choose one. Exile target creature with power toughness, one or less. Counter target sorcery spell. Put a 1-1 one, one colorless Eldrazi sign creature token on the battlefield, blah, 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 blah. That's what this card does. I don't care. No thanks. Just no thanks. Number one, exile target creature with power or toughness one or less. Well, well, nothing has, you know, toughness zero, so you're only getting X ones. And there's not a huge number of X ones that I'm terrified of in this set, if any. There's almost none, if any, uh, one Xs or zero Xs that I'm terrified in this set. Maybe I'm getting just locked down by a fortified rampart or a wall of resurgence, and this would be a decent sideboard card for that mode. But otherwise, this mode just seems bad. I... I I see no reason in this set or Battle for Zendikar to main deck uh, a card that exiles a creature with one or less, one or less power or toughness. I, I just don't see it. Counter target sorcery spell. That's horrid. <laughs> that is just horrid. Um, you don't main deck negate, which counters sorceries and instants and artifacts and enchantments and planeswalkers. Why would you main deck a card that counters target sorcery spell so i wouldn't main deck mode number one i wouldn't main deck mode number two i would sideboard them in pretty heavily definitely both of those are decent sideboard spells 
Mode number three is awful. I, I would never pay two mana for a Scion. Never, ever, ever would I pay two mana for a Scion. Just wouldn't happen. Um, so, yeah, I, blech. I, I see no point in main decking Warping Whale. Um, I've got to go with a straight-up D on it. I think it's totally fine as a sideboard card if you find out that you're up against a wall or maybe some sort of X1 flyer you can't handle or whatnot. Uh, or if you do see some sorcery spells that are really serious business, then yeah, side it in. But I don't think you want to main deck it, and I don't think you want to go out of your way to take it. So, D. That's going to wrap it up for the colorless cards. Let's move on into the gold cards. Up first, we have Flare Drone. Flare Drone is one generic, one black, one red. For a creature Eldrazi drone at Uncommon, it's a 3-1. It has Devoid, it has First Strike, and whenever another colorless creature enters the battlefield under your control, target opponent loses one life. So, yeah, this is a 3-1 for 3, which is okay. I prefer to play 3-1s for 2, but this one gets First Strike, which is a pretty solid upside. 3-1 um, First Strike for 3, sounds totally fine to me. Getting incremental life loss, the more colorless creatures I play, or the more uh, scions that I produce... Um, that, that's pretty fine by me. Really, the only downside of this card is that it's two colors, I guess. You know, but even that's not a huge downside. Um, seems like a super solid pickup to me, and it's enough for me to actually consider going black-red if I'm just one of those colors so far. I don't quite think it's first pick. I, I don't want to jump into black-red pick one because of this card, um, but I would jump in on black-red kind of pick three, pink, pick four, uh, or at the very least splash for this thing. Uh, I'm pretty darn happy with Flare Drone, and I've got to go with a B-minus on it. Next up, we have Mind Melter. Mind Melter is one blue-black for a creature Eldrazi drone at Uncommon. It's a 2-2. Two -two. It has Devoid. Mind Melter can't be blocked. And for three and a colorless, you can have target opponent exile a card from his or her hand. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery spell. Um, yeah, Mind Melter, 2-2 two -two unblockable for three. Seems totally cool to me. That is a nice, aggressive little creature. I also do like the ability, although being sorcery speed does limit it heavily. Uh, once your opponent's hand is empty, the card they drew each turn will either get played, or if it's kept, it means they can't play it. They don't have a target or they don't have the mana, or they just don't care. They don't care that you're going to spend four mana to get rid of it. And so that actually makes me think that once your opponent's hand is empty, it's not always going to be worth it to get that card out of their hand. If you have something else to do with your four mana, I think it's generally going to be correct to do something with that four mana. Play a creature, play something else. Don't just tackle that card that's sitting in their hand because there's a very good chance that it's just a land or it's something they can't cast anyways. Um, you might get bit occasionally if they then draw their land and it was a big bomb creature and then they play it. Um, but I think it's going to be often the correct play to do something else when they're down to one card in hand and uh, they did not play it, allowing you, knowing that you will have the option to get rid of it. Um, so be careful with that. But I think this is just a super solid creature, uh, a 2-2 two -two unblockable for three with a really nice, fun little ability. Uh, B minus. Uh, it seems like a really high pick to me and uh, I would happily put it in every blue-black deck I play. Next up, we have Void Grafter. Void Grafter is one green blue creature Eldrazi drone at Uncommon. It's a 2 4. It has Devoid. It has Flash. And when Void Grafter enters the battlefield, another target creature you control gains Hexproof until end of turn. Uh, yeah, we've got another three drop. This one is a 2 4, which is pretty undercosted. Usually we pay four mana for a 2 4. Um, so I'm pretty happy to see that. The fact that it has flash is awesome. A 2-4 flash is an incredible blocker. That's going to block most things that are attacking you that are outside of uh, bomb territory. Um, the fact that it can kind of fizzle any removal or negative ability that's being played against your creature is awesome. Uh, this card just seems super great. Assuming green gets a little bit more playable, which after yesterday's review, I'm not entirely certain of, this card seems super awesome. Um, outside of the set, outside of what we know about green from Battle for Zendikar and, and what uh, the review looks like, I'm really happy with this card. We'll have to see how the actual archetypes and colors shape up, but I'm pretty happy to give this a B for now and uh, see how it goes from there. 
Next up, we have Ailey. Ailey? Ailey? I don't know how you pronounce that. Ailey, Eternal Pilgrim. Ailey is a white and a black for a legendary creature core cleric at rare. She's a 2-3. She has Death Touch. For one generic mana and sacking another creature, note another creature, you gain life equal to the sacrificed creature's toughness. For one generic, a white and a black, and sacking another creature, you can exile target non-land permanent. Activate this ability only if you have at least 10 more life than your starting life total. So 30 in a, a normal 1v1 draft or sealed situation. Um, this is basically a 2-3 death touch for two. Even if you're sacking your own creatures to get up to 30 plus life, I just don't see you regularly getting there enough to turn on the second ability. Yeah, you only have to sacrifice 10 toughness worth of uh, creatures to get there, but that's assuming that your opponent isn't playing the game. That's assuming your opponent is not damaging you. Realistically, you're more going to need to deal, you know, sacrifice 12, 15 toughness worth of creatures. And if you're doing that, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what your deck is doing and why you're not winning the game if you have that many creatures to throw away. So I don't think the second ability will really turn on that much at all. And I think the first ability is just kind of a nice incidental life gain uh, that you'll get out of sacking a creature that's going to die anyways. But that's about it. She's a totally fine creature. I think she's a great include in white, white black decks. I would play a 2-3 death touch for two any day of the week. This is a super solid card. Could even be a little bit aggressive. Get in for two uh, if your opponent doesn't want to throw away whatever blockers they have into a death toucher. Um, so I'm pretty happy to have Ailey. Uh, I put her at a B minus. I, I don't think she's first pick in any way, shape, or form. But I think once you're white, black, you'd totally take her. And I think once you're white or black, you definitely strongly consider taking her and going into the other color as well. Uh, I, I've got to go with a solid B on her. I think she's fine. I just don't think those abilities are going to do too much in a, a, a limited match. Next up, we have Baloth Null. Baloth Null is a four black green creature zombie beast at Uncommon. It's a four five. And when Baloth Null enters the battlefield, return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. A 4-5 for 6 is a touch expensive, so I wanted to do something good. Getting back two creatures from your graveyard to your hand, we know I don't like that. We know that I don't like Dutiful Return, that I never play it, that I hate it. But getting that plus a 4-5, well, that's another story entirely. If we assume that Dutiful Return is a 4-mana ability, Dutiful Return is a 4-mana card, that means that we're paying 2-mana for a 4-5. That is some serious value. This creature is just all around solid. I think it's a great pickup. I don't think it's first pick. Um, I think you take it when you're in one of these colors already to go into the other color, and you definitely always take it when you are in black green. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy with this. It's an ability that I don't like when it's a card that only does that. But when I get a legitimate creature attached to that ability, I'm pretty darn okay with it. So Baloth Null is going to get a solid B for me. I think it's a great pickup when you're in these colors and totally consideration uh, when you are in one of them. Um, yeah, I, I just really like it. it. It's basically, if we do assume four mana for that ability, a really cheap creature with an, uh, another card attached to it. So Baloth Null, solid B, play this guy. Next up, we have Cliffhaven Vampire. Cliffhaven Vampire is a two white black creature vampire warrior ally at Uncommon. It's a 2 4 flyer, and whenever you gain a life, each opponent loses one life. So, this is kind of like a, a slightly less good version of some of the uh, black white life gain creatures in Battle for Zendikar. Um, but it is that, that 2 4 for 4 that I really like that blocks really well while still being a little bit aggressive, uh, especially with it being a flyer. Uh, its ability to kind of satisfy both the attacking and blocking roles as appropriate definitely makes me interested in this if I'm in black-white. I'm not sure if it draws me into those colors if I'm only one of them. Um, it's close. It might. And if I do have any sort of uh, life gain theme going on, which definitely is a little bit less in uh, Oath of the Gatewatch than it was in Battle for Zendikar. And remember, we only get one pack of Battle for Zendikar, so you're not going to get four Calastria healers with this, I, I hope. Um, 
but you still could get some value out of it. Um, overall, I think it's just a totally fine card. I, I give it a B minus. I think you'll take it uh, pretty rapidly if you're in these two colors. And if you're in one of them, uh, you, you might consider it. Um, it. It might be a decent pickup depending on what else is in the pack. But you'll always play it if you're black white. So B minus for me. Next up, we have Jiraga Auxiliary. Jiraga Auxiliary is a one green white creature elf soldier ally at Uncommon. Uh, it is a 2-3. And if you pay four green white, you get to support two. Um, uh, as I've said, I'm not super sold on support being amazing. Um, I, I feel like you really need to get the full value out of most of the support cards in order for them to be okay. Now, this is a three drop two three, which is at least all right, if a little bit expensive. We all know I like three twos for three more than I like two threes for three. Um, but if you do end up in a board stall, you can start building up for the win. Um, the fact that this can't pump itself is a little bit problematic. Um, it, it means that you need a minimum of three creatures on board. Uh, in order to and, and six mana in order to get the the full value out of it, I think it'll be fine, and I'll, I'll definitely include it more often than I'll cut it. Uh, just as a two three for three that happens to have some uh, uh, late game ability to it. It kind of reminds me of Cliffside Lookout, to be honest. It's a card that by itself isn't that good, and doesn't always make it to the end game but it, when it does make it to the end game it, it does something decent and I think this is really similar to that I'm going to go with a C plus on it I, I will include it more often than I won't uh, but I'm not going to go out of my way to get it I, I'm not going to snap it up like I am uh, you know a flare drone or a Baloth null or something like that but C plus next up we have Jory N Ruin Diver Jory N is a one blue red legendary creature, Merfolk Wizard at rare. She's a 2-3, and she says whenever you cast your second spell each turn, draw a card. We know that I don't like Surge. You don't cast multiple spells a turn all that often in limited. If you do, your hand is empty. Your hand is very rapidly empty if you're casting multiple spells a turn, multiple turns in a game. In Constructed, yeah, you can pump your deck full of cantrips and things that draw you extra cards and ways to refill your hand, but you don't get that luxury in limited. I'm iffy about Surge. I'm iffy about Jory and Ruin Diver. Now, Jory and Ruin Diver doesn't even work in Two-Headed Giant, like Surge does at least. Um, so really, to me, this is basically a 2-3 three for 3 that has a minimal upside. Minimal upside. Um... It's not a big enough upside, for, though, for me to, to put this into a, into a C+. Uh, I'm just not willing to do that. I go with a straight middle-of-the-road C on this. Uh, I think you play it if you have it and you don't have anything better. Um, but I'm just not looking to get this. This is a card that I'm going to open as a rare, and I'm just going to go, ugh. I'm not going to hate it as much as opening an Oath or something or uh, Call the Gate Watch, but uh, I won't be terribly excited, and I expect this thing to wheel uh, pretty frequently, even in pack two, where somebody is probably going to be blue-red already and still not really care for this. So straight up C, terribly unexciting. Next up, we have Mina and Den, Wildborn. They are a two red-green legendary creature elf ally at rare. They're a 4-4. Four -four. And you can play an additional land on each of your turns. And for red and a green and return a land you control to its owner's hand, target creature gains trample until end of turn. So this is a 4-4-4. Four, four, four. That's fine. That's totally and utterly fine right then and there. And you get to put down an additional land drop each turn. That is super awesome. That is some of the best ramp you can ever have. Oracle of Muldaya, fantastic absolutely great card um the trample land bounce effect has very big imp implications for the landfall decks landfall is not that common in oath of the gate watch i think we just have the embodiments actually i can't actually think if there's anything other than the two embodiments that uh care about landfall so all the landfall stuff is going to come out of that one single pack of battle for zendikar this is another card that makes me really 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 assume that this was originally supposed to be Oath Battle Battle back when it was still a three-block set. Because um, this card really wants to be in the Landfall deck, and the Landfall deck I just don't think is going to be a big thing with a single pack of battle. Um, but 
I still really like this card. It's still a 4-4-4-4 four, 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 four that ramps you like crazy. Um, plus, if you do get those landfall cards, you can uh, do some fun things with bouncing the land, having a second land uh, fall, or uh, a second land drop each turn. Just some really fun things. I would actually happily first pick this and go into red-green and just destroy that pack of Battle for Zendikar for all of its landfall stuff uh, at the end of the draft. So A- minus for me. Very happy with Mina and Den Wildborn. Next up, we have Reflector Mage. Reflector Mage is a one white blue creature human wizard at uncommon. It's a 2 3. When Reflector Mage enters the battlefield, return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. That creature's owner can't cast spells with the same name as that creature until your next turn. I love bounce. Love bounce. I love bounce on creatures. This just seems absolutely insane. Three mana for a 2-3, it bounces, and it denies your opponent from playing that creature next turn. That is some serious tempo. Serious tempo. Very, very, very cool. I can't wait to play this thing. I'm going to take it super highly. It's not quite first pick because I don't want to devote to blue-white just based off of this, although it maybe I do. I'm not quite sure there. Drawn as Emissary was first pick as a red or as a black-white card. Oh, you know what? I talked myself into it. This is first pickable, I think, in a, a number of decks. It's just so powerful, and blue-white should be just as decently good as it was in battle uh, in Oath. So I'm going to go with an A- minus on this. Very careful. I, I, I don't want to say don't use this on a land creature. Use this on a land creature that's been awakened. That, that is a good play. However, lands are not cast. Your opponent can put that land down next turn because they are playing that land. They are not casting that land. So it does not stop lands from being replayed the next turn. Be very careful with that. But I think generally if it's an awakened land, it, it'll still probably be the correct choice to bounce it. Uh, but yeah, Reflector Mage, super happy. A minus. I talked myself into first picking it. We'll see if it's as good as I hope it is. Next up, we have Relentless Hunter. Relentless Hunter is a one red green creature human warrior at uncommon. It's a 3-3. And for its casting cost, for one green red, you can give it plus one, plus one and trample until end of turn. Seems fine. Three mana, three, three. Totally fine. Totally perfectly passes the vanilla test. Uh, for its casting cost, which assuming you played this naturally, assuming you didn't use a scion or something, you can immediately the next turn make it a 4-4 four, four trample. Seems really good. Later in the game, maybe making this a 5-5 five, five trample, maybe a 6-6 six, six trample, but that's asking a little bit much. Uh, seems totally fine. Totally includable. If you're red-green, I think you take this card easily, and I think you always play it. I don't quite think it draws you into the second color, though, if you are just one of them. Um, and I'm also nervous about red-green, because they seem to be the weakest colors by far in Oath. We'll see how that plays out, but in a vacuum, just kind of looking at this card, not assuming that those colors are going to be stone unplayable in a set, because that's a bad way to go in. Uh, I give this a B-. I, I think it's just fine. Next up, we have Storm Chaser Mage. Storm Chaser Mage is a blue and a red for a creature human wizard at uncommon. It's a 1-3 flying haste prowess. Ah, prowess. Um, I've talked a lot about this, obviously, back when it was a, a, a set mechanic as opposed to it now being an evergreen mechanic. It's just not a limited mechanic to me. Prowess is great in Constructed, where you are playing non-creature spells left and right. In Limited, you do not play non-creature spells left and right. You trigger it a couple of times at best during a game. So it's just not really something you can, should consider too, too much of an upside. It's an upside. It absolutely is an upside, but it's not a big one. So really, this is a 1-3 Hasty Flyer, which is okay. It blocks all right, and it, it's a cheap investment, but it is still just a territorial rock that has haste and sometimes is a 2-4 for, for a brief period of time. Um, I'm not excited about it. I might play it in a blue-red deck, but I'm not going to go out of my way to take it. And I'll, I'll leave it behind if I see something better. And I think there's a whole lot that is better. So it, it's kind of like a, a, a definition of a C to me. I'm just not excited about Storm Chaser Mage. Finally... For the last card of the gold and colorless set review, we have Weapons Trainer. Weapons Trainer is a red-white creature human soldier ally at Uncommon. It's a 3-2, and other creatures you control get plus 1, plus 0, oh, as long as you control 
an equipment. The equipment deck's a trap. Don't fall for it. Do not fall for it. Don't go into it. The equipment in this set, as we will find out tomorrow, is not good. There's one or two that I would consider maybe good in certain situations at rare. So Weapons Trainer just is not going to pull it off. It is a 3-2 for 2, which is totally fine. Totally and super playable. Uh, I've said I really like 3-2s for 3. I think that's a fine playable enough card. So a 3-2 for 2 is, you know, that much better. But I don't think the ability is going to trigger. And I don't think you should go out of your way. Even if I had one of these, I still would not pick up and play a Bone Saw. I still would not do it. Um... Yeah, I, I just, I don't care about that ability. The equipment I do not like. So I think it's fine. I think it's a C plus. I think it's a, a really nicely costed, nice aggressive creature. It's an ally. I think it's totally fine to include this in your red white deck. I don't think you really want to put in bad equipment to try to trigger it though. So C plus for me. So that's going to wrap it up for the colorless and multicolored set review. Tons of interesting cards in there as there always are in the gold, uh, uh, set reviews and colorless set reviews um i think a lot of the cards are going to fit really nicely into their color pairs for the gold ones uh, a number of them will pull you into those colors a number of them i think are just good once you know you're those colors the colorless ones all look super interesting and i'm really intrigued uh with the colorless aspect of this set for as much as i hate surge and don't terribly care for support and cohort I really like the colorless matters mechanic. I'm really excited to give that a play and see how that works out. Um, but that's going to wrap it up for this set review. Definitely let me know what you agree with, what you disagree with, what you think about these uh, uh, two miscellaneous subsets of the cards. What cards are you looking forward to? And as always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at the Manaleek, that's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. And you can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Manaleek. You found me here on YouTube, so make use of those comments for the reasons I said. Uh, I've loved interacting with you guys. I've seen fantastic comments. This is probably the most comments I've seen on a set review. Uh, I love how much... Uh, uh, the viewer base kind of explodes with every set review that comes out. Um, love seeing you guys interact with each other down there and interact with me. Keep it up. Fantastic. If you like my videos, please like them with the little thumbs up icon. That probably, I don't actually know how those work. That probably does something with algorithms, but it also makes me feel happy. It makes me feel nice to see little thumbs up happening. So click that thumbs up button and also subscribe so that you can see when the last set review video goes up tomorrow, as well as all of the other set review or set release material that's going to come out. There's going to be pre-release recaps with video of the tournament that I'm at in paper uh, this weekend. There are just going to be, uh, you know, first FNM draft over the shoulder videos. You can see a draft the first night that it happens. It will be up here for you to see, plus all the other usual regularly scheduled programming. Crack a Pack Tuesdays, Wacky Wednesdays, Top 10 Thursdays, Spiky Saturdays, and all the other videos that pop up here and or there. But as always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you all next time.